Welcome everyone. It's two o'clock and this is a meeting of the congressional data task force. We will get started in about two minutes. So we'll just give everyone time to join. And so welcome those of you who already are here. We have an exciting schedule. One of the things we are in the WebEx platform. So I want to just point out that um, many of you are some are participants and we do have the Q and A function open. So if you have a question, we would love for you to put your question in the Q and A chat and we will answer it um, throughout the meeting. There will also be times that um, we can, we'll have discussion and we'll unmute um, the participants so that you can um, participate verbally. Otherwise, um, throughout the presentations, please um, use the Q and A. And we also have the hand raising feature that you can use um, when we get to the Q&A sessions. Again, it's just 201, so we'll give a couple folks um, time to join. One of the reminders about being in WebEx is please make sure that the name you have displayed is your name, not your one of your family members or your colleagues, but your own name. And again, we'll start around 202 and we're going to end at 4 o'clock today. Great, I have 202, so I'd love to get this meeting started. My name is Kirsten Gullickson. I'm the coordinator of the Congressional Data Task Force, and this is our second public meeting. It's Tuesday, June 21st. And as many of you know, the Bulk Data Task Force is a partnership of representatives from across the various ledge branch agencies. And many of us are here today and want to present and have discussions with you about congressional data. So, thank you all for coming. I know other people are, are joining. This is a 2 hour long meeting today. So thank you. Um, the congressional, um, the bulk data task force was created in 2002 to focus on our increased dissemination of congressional information via bulk data. Um, our current work goes beyond bulk data, um, but we do meet um, publicly and internally about congressional data. And again, this is a public meeting. If you have want any information about our task force, we do have it on our legislative branch innovation hub. And internally, we are currently talking about expanding and adding additional material to this website. And we are um, pretty regularly updating it. So it is a good um, source of information. And thank you GPO for hosting our innovation hub. Today's meeting, this is our agenda. We're going to have um, some welcome and background information and some announcements this morning. We are first going to have um, our civil society organizations and our public interest advocates go. Um, my sincere apologies at our last public meeting. Our meeting was only 90 minutes long and we ran short on time. So a number of our um, out, outside groups, as um, former deputy clerk Reeves would call you, um, did not get to speak. So we are going to have you on the agenda first. And, um, and so I'm, we have three exciting um, speakers at, um, from a number of organizations. Then we'll move into our ledge branch agency and organization um, updates and briefings. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. And again, we're committed to starting on time and ending on time. So four o'clock is our end time. Again, just that housekeeping information um, the meeting will be recorded, is being recorded, and it will be posted online at um, on the Innovation Hub. Again, we have that Q&A feature, and we have the raise hand feature, and again, just make sure that your name is um, displayed is who you are. Um, I always like to start um, our, our meetings with a little overview information for those of you who may be attending our meetings for the first time. Or, and so any of you who are new, thank you for joining us today. And one of our shared challenges, um, not only our um, legislative body, the House and the Senate, but all legislative bodies and parliaments and lawmaking organizations, we have um, a number of shared tasks that we have to do. And that's to prepare, manage, distribute, and preserve our official documents and records. And so we've been doing that since the start of our great institution. And, um, and we know that the paper version 
um, today, just like it was 200 years ago, is still the official document of record. So we do have to preserve and take care of that um, official document of record. But um, for many, many years now, we've been adding a digital layer to that centuries old paper process. And I'd like to um, pick out um, pictures of the end of our legislative process when the president is signing um, law um, bills into law. And this time I added a, a picture of the speaker signing an enrollment as well. But I, I look for pictures that show you the size of our documents. So the, these four pictures represent different sizes. This is a single page um, document. It's actually um, made Juneteenth the federal holiday. And you can see um, the signatures of all of the, the folks that need to sign it. And then you can see the different sizes of presentation cases here in these pictures. So you can tell the volume or the size of the paper documents that we need to um, deal with. We know, we've known for years now that online means more than just the electronic representation of the paper document. So we know we have a number of projects over the years that have scanned in our official documents over time. And that's important for transparency and to get those documents up online. But we know we want this material to be in structured um, data so that we can manipulate it, we can display it, we can search it. Um, certainly this scanned PDF here is not something that's very searchable. So our solution, as we all know, is structured data. And the task force spends a lot of its time talking about XML, JSON, and HTML. There's a great um, developers hub at GPO that gives you some more insight into that data. Also, for those of you who may be new with working with documents, I always like to point out that documents share three characteristics once we put it into XML or even into HTML. We have to worry about its presentation. So how do we take that paper document and make it look good on the screen so that its presentation, its structure, how is that XML um, content organized, and the semantics, what does it mean? What does that content and data mean? And so that um, poses some challenges for us when we're talking about presentation, structure, and semantics. We do have some solutions. So um, many of you are aware that we're um, working on standardized formats for legislative documents with a new schema called United States Legislative Markup. On our Innovation Hub, we have a number of reports that the clerk's office has um, submitted on behalf of the clerk's organization, and it mentions many of the organizations um, here on the call that are working on that standardization. So those reports are there. If you're new to any of this work, that initial report that we submitted will give you much of the history of how we started um, our XML journey. We also use um, other solutions, JSON, HTML. So I'm excited to let you know that Robert from the Library of Congress has some great news around um, JSON formats. And that's your clue to what he might be announcing. And also Matt is gonna be giving some information about um, responsive HTML with our build text. So those are some exciting things coming up in the meeting. For those of you um, who might be new, we do have um, our data exchange is pretty simple. We exchange data across that between the House and the Senate um, with GPO and with the Library of Congress. And we do have comprehensive workflows that are up on the innovation hub. Again, adding a digital layer to a centuries old process um, is challenging, but we are meeting those challenges. And um, I add, I have this slide as a hangover from uh, our March public meeting. Just again, wanting to show you the size of some of the paper documents that we have to exchange between the House and the Senate. This document happens to be 2,124 pages and fits in several um, presentation ca cases and we need a hand chart to carry it back and forth. <laughs> Since the last meeting, we had a congressional hackathon sponsored by leaders Ho uh, Hoyer and McCarthy. Um, and if Stephen is on the call, I will ask him to give a little um, summary of that. Um, in addition, there was excellent hearing um, by the Committee on Modernization of Congress about the modernizing the legislative process and the bill drafting process. The written testimony is available as well as the video. So if you have not caught that and are interested in that workflow, there's some good material there in that hearing. And then um, one of the great things is that we really are focusing on 
training and education. So I just wanted to point out that a number of outside folks um, sponsored the internal Palooza last week and our CAO's office had a district caseworker training last week. So um, not always directly related to our data, but they're certainly looking at our data that we are um, responsible for. And so that training is very appreciative. There you go. Um, one big announcement that I want to make, and then I'll introduce our first speaker, um, the Congressional Data Task Force. If you didn't notice that, our name has changed as effective today. We are no longer the bulk data task force. We are the Congressional Data Task Force. Um, last week, the Committee on House Administration sent a letter to the clerk directing the name change. Um, and so here's an excerpt of that letter. And um, some of you know that we did um, the clerk's the clerk and all of our staff in the clerk's office support the name change. She mentioned that in her testimony in January. And um, in, for those of you um, who've been following along with the name change, this was a recommendation by the select committee on the modernization of Congress. It was recommendation number four. So we're happy that um, this recommendation has been completed. And with that, I do have an exciting announcement. I do have a, a, a special guest. Um, from the select committee, Yuri Beckelman, and he is next on our agenda. So, Yuri, I'd love to hand the floor over to you for some remarks. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to touch base on a couple of things that are going through the committee right now that we're really excited about. Um, we have another hearing coming up uh, this week, specifically on Congress and technology. I'll get that in a minute. We're very excited about. We're going to have uh, a hearing on a customer friendly Congress, which really is trying to cover casework and constituent services and things like that. And then later on in the year, we're going to have something on the future of technology and modernization efforts by the House so, uh, or in Congress in general. Um, at the Congress and Technology hearing, the main focus of it is going to be on um, we have a couple of different areas. Uh, improving the startup ecosystem, uh, tackling institutional challenges and identifying opportunities. Um, just some really big fun ideas that we want to throw in there that I think will kind of shake things up. Um, and then smaller things that we think are important to onboarding technology talent and really uh, recruiting and retaining some of the best. Um, so we're really excited. I think we're gonna, it's going to be one of our one of our uh, hearings that generates the largest amount of recommendations, and we are still looking for recommendations. Although we've been working with a few people, a few people on this call to kind of uh, pull together some of the ideas that have been out in, in the um, uh, it kind of being discussed for a long time. Um, and if you watch the hearing, see something that sparks your interest, you want to know more about or something that you think was left out, please feel free to reach out to us. We're gonna be looking for lots and lots of recommendations in this space. Um, we're really excited. Uh, if we're getting past the hearings, we're really excited because we just got the committee mark um, on the modern, on the ledge branch uh, appropriations uh, bill. And it has a $10 million fund for the modernization initiatives account, which is an increase from the $2 million that was in it before. For those of that you don't that you don't for those of you that do not know about this, this is a specific account that is available for uh, to help implement recommendations by the modernization account uh, by the modernization committee. Um, there's a whole bunch of things underneath it that we recommended specifically that would be that would be great for this a tool for committee chairs to receive back, uh, feedback from committee members. Um, a tool we refer to uh, as a a Craigslist for policy to match legislators based on interests, um, a web portal for a directory of staff in the House and support agencies, um, a way to automate and simplify the co-sponsorship process. Just a, there's a whole bunch of, of, of opportunities here that could access this fund, um, and and we're hopefully we're hoping it gets used. Um, and additionally, we have. Um, We've seen some other things in this bill that will hopefully allow us to recruit some really great talent. We're seeing changes to um, some of the compensation packages. The idea that uh, we're going to we're hoping that the the bill will allow for more staff certification. So if you are a technical talent coming to the house looking for certificate, looking to give up certifications, there has been a ban on that in the past on using MRA funds to access certifications, and this is. 
And this is unfortunate because we have a lot of technical talent that that have to spend out of pocket to keep up with the certifications. This would change that uh, and allow you to access this. So we've got quite a bit of really interesting stuff going on, and we're we're really excited. We're also really excited about the the name change. I think it better encapsulates the work that this group has been doing, and this work is going to be uh, that this group is going to be doing into the future. Um, so we're just really excited about all of it. So this has been a, a, a good time. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, thank you, Yuri, for that. My, one of my questions for you, Yuri, yeah. is if we do watch that hearing or if we have any ideas that we spark, how, how is it best to get in contact with you? So I'll write it in the chat, but we have a member services staffer, Ananda Bhatia, and she has a running list of recommendations. And we chase down everything. They don't go into, um, they don't just disappear. It, you can send them to her. You can send them through our website. We we literally have a physical box in front of the office that you can come fill out a piece of paper and leave it in there, and it will go into our tracking list of things that we think that we want to see whether they'd be a good idea to include on our list of recommendations before the end of the year or not. Great, great. I love it, and I love that you worked so hard to get the MRA up for the training. It was it for those of us who come from a member's office. It's always been kind of hard to 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 know how to spend money on training for staff. So thank you. Yeah. I know that I think in the house officers, we have a little easier time, but even opening it up to make sure that we have access to training. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, the staff academy uh, really is doing so much. They really, we, for a long time, we've had a problem with uh, either having a, a training program put together by people who have never done the job or are by people who do the job, but aren't necessarily great at telling the story of how to do the job. And so, the staff academy has done a really good job of marrying those two people who have done the job, but can also write curriculum and are also responsive uh, directly to the needs and wants and requests of, of, of what a staffer needs to do their job. And a lot of this stuff is a lot more technical than it used to be. Um, and, you know, I, I, I will say that the, the old house staff academy did teach me my first uh, couple lessons in HTML. So I give them credit for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, I, you know, they're doing a much more comprehensive job now and I, I, a lot of a lot of kudos to the whole team at CIO for really revamping the whole program. Exactly. And there's a number of us in the clerk's office who have had direct, you know, we work with that team um, closely every almost every week. And, um, yes, I have, um, uh, we, my teaching ability hasn't been improved and, um, by the experts, um, not only who are currently there, but a couple of former employees that really came in and um, and said, Kirsten, if you just tweak this a little bit, you'd get more retention and your learners would learn more. And I, it took a little while, but they're doing a great job and we love working with them. So, um, and I think those programs are great. Um, anything else, Yuri? Yeah, no, I, I wanted to touch this really quickly on a few other things that we're just really excited about. The Ledge Branch bill also had something for an intern office, which I think would be really exciting. That um, we've also seen increases in um, and and money available to bring on interns. So I'm hoping that the combination of higher uh, MRA, better training, uh, more opportunities for education, uh, continuing education, more uh, pass onboarding through for interns, that we're gonna be able to do a better job of. Uh, recruiting technical talent, project managers, CX, UX designers. These are things that have we have not really focused on in the past. And I think that um, we haven't been competitive, but if you look at what the house digital service is doing, I think they're, I think I'm really excited with what they're, the, the plans they're laying out. And I think one of the big things we'd like to take on in this hearing is also how we can really uh, replicate and emulate what you all are doing here and kind of maybe expanding this to some other services so that we can really have a, a broad look, not just at data, but at digital services across the entirety of, of uh, not just the house, but all of Congress, the business support offices and the congressional support agencies, which is, which is what you all do. But when we're looking at technology, we generally leave the business. If we include the business board office, we're definitely not getting to the support agencies like CBO and, and you know, and, and GSA, and, and we really need to bring them into the conversation if we're going to really tackle technology as an institution. Exactly, exactly. And um, you know, I've been a cheerleader and advocate for for collapsing our silos across the ledge branch for a long time. So I'm glad that that we're starting to examine some of that more. So, and I'm hoping the hearing brings out some of those challenges, and um, it's still not still balance out 
the innovation and kind of the fact that every we're all small business units and, and a member can be innovative, but then where how do we channel that innovation into into a large ecosystem? And so yeah, it's, it's it's extremely important because the answer is not enterprise wide solutions for everything. And 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 we we do need to do a better job of creating communities of practice for large scale applications. But one of our greatest strengths really is is that we're allowed to kind of experiment and create a startup startup ecosystem. I was in Colombia recently with their modernization committee having a discussion and I asked them about their startup ecosystem and they gave me sort of a blank stare of we have contracting rules that don't allow us to do any of this. And I just and it helped kind of bring into focus the real opportunity we have if we make it easier to both uh, to both for people who are interested in, in, in bringing products and ideas to us, but also offices to find partners to work with and then be able to upscale those for other offices who might want to take those take that opportunity and run with it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And there's also then for me looking at the UK model where they have one central IT governance office and they can just kind of have a package of solutions to their mem to their members. There's that model too. So how do we how do we have both? And so I I'm, I'm looking forward to the hearing. So thank you so much, Jerry. Anything else? That's all I got. <laughs> okay, great. We'll move on with our agenda and um if you can stick around, we'll uh, open up for Q&A a little bit if folks have Q&A um afterwards, but it, we understand if you're scheduled busy and you need to drop off today. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to I'm watching. I'm doing some other stuff, but I'm hanging awesome. out too. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. Um I I do see Stephen Dwyer in the um in the participant list. Um Damien, can you um make him a panelist if he's available just to see if he want uh Stephen, if you want to give us a a little quick summary of the hackathon from from April. We'll see if he. Yeah, just real quick. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, thank so many of you. Thank you so much for joining our hackathon. We think it was a really productive event. Um, we're still working on the big report that we release after the fact with all the recommendations and things that were topics that were covered. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of fun and um, it's a lot about community building. And so thank you for all of you for joining us. Um, that's all Kirsten. Go ahead. Great. Great. Thanks, Steve. And we look forward to that report. I do know um, that our next speaker. Um, Daniel Schumann from the Congressional Data Coalition in Demand Progress has a, a, a write up of the hackathon. And so I will call on Daniel for you to um, give your remarks. And I have you down for eight minutes, Daniel. Oh, that's enough time for me to read the entirety of my uh, summary of the hackathon. I guess it's not funny for anyone. Anyway, well, thank you so much for, for letting me join you. I'm so glad that you're hosting the second one of these this year. And congratulations a decade later from the bulk data task force, to the congressional data task force. It's, uh, it's fun to see how these things change. So, my announcement is short and sweet. Uh, many of you may remember from. I guess 2 meetings ago are in the hackathon as well. Our presentation. On the bill map tool, uh, uh, if you don't remember bill map. Uh, tracks legislative ideas as they move through the process, they take bills and break them into the constituent pieces. And look to see where else those pieces have been mentioned. So you can track a bill across uh, an idea and a bill across uh, the current Congress and through prior Congresses as well, and then see all the things that are related to those little pieces of legislation, all the reports and CPO scores and things like that. Uh, so the announcement that I have is that we have successfully built uh, two APIs that uh, make available um, the the ability basically to to you know to provide a bill number and have it report out um, uh, related legislation, whether from the current Congress or prior Congresses. Uh, we're still fi finishing up the testing on it, but it seems to work well. Uh, so that way, if you don't wanna go to our website, you'll be able to go to our API and um, find related legislation to your heart's content, uh, both current and historical. Uh, and of course, the code is up on GitHub, just as the code is from the Bill Map project. Uh, so that um, if you want to run your own version or modify the code, uh, it is free and open source and everybody is welcome to do so. Uh, so I will uh, yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for the chance to talk. You're welcome. I do have a question for you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. What repository on GitHub are your APIs? Oh, I will, I, will, I will follow up after the meeting and send you the links. Okay, great. We'll make sure that we include those in our event summary. 
um, on the innovation um, hub. So thank you for that. And if you get it before that, feel free to um, put it in the chat. So okay. that'll be great. Thank you, Daniel. And next up on our schedule, um, we have Lars from the Lincoln Network. He is going to um, talk about some of the work that he's doing with videos and hearings and um, and update us from some of the information that he has um, presented at the hackathon. So, Lars, it's all yours. All right, I'll get started. Just let me. Hello, I'm Lars Schoenander at the Lincoln Network, and I'd like to present to you on a project that me and Lincoln have been working on for nearly a year at this point, which is a central website for Senate committee hearings. As you all might know, working in the space, there's no actual central website, unfortunately, due to the politics of the Senate of a central committee website. If you want to search for hearings, you have to go to every single different website to go find the individual hearing you're interested. This is a bit of a pain. However, so with thanks to Daniel Schumann to give him this idea, I decided to go solve it. The solution was simple, simply build a central website in one single place with all the information. Here are the links to the two parts. One's the actual scraper, which is the script that goes through every single committee website and then create a spreadsheet for each individual hearing, not hearing, every individual committee and then a master spreadsheet for all the committees and then the link to the actual committee website. I'm just warning you at ahead of time because GitHub is blocked in congressional Wi-Fi. If you're on House or Senate net, you won't be able to use the website at the moment. That should be resolved soon through just modifying where the files are being served from. And just a simple demo, just a simple picture demo on the master page. Just some simple data to display how many hearings over time, plus the ability through a tabular data to search through every single committee hearing. So you can search through titles, you can search committee, you can search through the witnesses. And there's also filtering options by year. There's also options to search by witnesses because an interesting proxy is that because you have a data set of all the hearings, you have a data set of all the witnesses and who chaired the given hearing. So you can search, for example, how many times Jerome Powell spoke in all his individual testimonies. This is, and as I say, goes back to the 90s, a searchable list of witness hearings. There's links to the videos. A latest development is that through some very interesting data engineering, I managed to get the links to the Senate committee hearing videos because you can't download them directly. So the unique methods and data and web scraping had to be taken. But as Carl Mahmoud knows, I am slowly but surely uploading the hearing videos to the Internet Archive. So to create a central repository for those as well, I'll happily share that link once this presentation is done. And again, just some basic user use experiences to help end users actually be able to search for the information they hear. And now for some of the downsides working in this data, it's been an interesting experience. Marginal in hindsight, but up until some basic user agent stuff, I kept get IP banned from the Senate. Many of you all know because each committee has a different vendor that the way the websites are developed is not standardized. They use typically different CSS classes and HTML elements to design things. The exception is the Joint Economic Committee, which is a whole different set of problems where they don't use classes at all to standardize this information. The way that tables are displayed is different. Sometimes you need to paginate, sometimes you can just sort of brute force display like 20,000 results at once. Unfortunately, the com committees don't necessarily communicate with each other when 
how to title people. For example, professional titles may go at the start or the end of somebody's name. Witnesses may have their middle name or may not have their middle name. Titles may be uppercase, lowercase, or on all caps. The way testimony PDFs are linked tends to vary per committee. Sometimes it's direct link to the page. Sometimes you have to jump multiple times. The URL schemas are not there, not mentioned here, but unfortunately at the moment, roughly all the testimony pages for 2012 for the Indian Affairs Committee are broken at the moment, which is unfortunate. And I would love you all suggestions on how to do this better, because frankly, this is something I've been working on for a while, and it can only get better with support from you all who have worked on this issue for far longer than I have. And I'm very excited just to learn more and figure out better ways to make this data more accessible to the public. And as a, as a final reminder, things I'm working on include upgrading ways to work with the testimony data, trying to link witness data to other data sets. I'm working on a project to link GovInfo data to that. And currently developing a basic tagging system. I have one developed using natural language processing, but as mentioned earlier, I plan to use, try to merge that ma manually, the GovInfo data of hearings with the actual Senate committee hearings so that the tagging systems used in the Library of Congress can be added to the individual hearings as well. And that's about it for the actual slides. Great, thanks Lars. Um, I love that you're doing this work and your enthusiasm for it. Um, I, I'm from I'm on the house side, but I can address the the questions you have about about the names, you know, in the in the middle initials. It it is one of our challenges to manage all the various names that a member of the house and a member of the senate uh, choose for themselves because sometimes they get here um, they get here and they want their name to be more closer to their legal name than it was on the ballot. And so we we do are trying to publish is those many different variations of their names as we can so that people can data map um, depending on what system hat carries what name, but it is is a challenge. So but thank you. Um, if you have any questions or answers for Lars, um, he is a panelist, so you can put that in the Q and A for him. And if there is any participants who have questions or answers, um, We'll we'll take that after Carl um, speaks. So, Lars, any other remarks? That's about all. Thanks for giving me the space to talk. You're you're welcome. We um, I'm glad that you could make it today. Thank you. Next on our schedule is um, Carl Malamud from the Public Research um, Organization. Carl. Hi there. Thank you, Kirsten, for inviting me. Lars, terrific work. He's got 2,300 videos of, of Senate hearings up on the Internet Archive, um, and, and that was not easy to do. So I, I run public resource, and what we do is we try to make uh, the law more readily available. We were accredited with um, putting the United States Court of Appeals back file online. Um, we worked with Speaker Boehner and were able to put uh, 14,000 hours of um, video of House hearings online. Um, my job was a little easier than Lars. Lars has had to do this very arcane process of grabbing the video. Um, I had a letter from the Speaker and I went to the House broadcast studio and they gave us copies of DVDs and, and things like that. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is a little bit outside of your wheelhouse. And that's a question of state regulations and uh, state codes. And I just wanted to put this on your radar you know, something that we're doing. Uh, we are working with uh, the Cornell Legal Information Institute, and you may know for their work on the uh, Code of Federal Regulations and the US Code and, and Supreme Court opinions. Um, with with two companies, Justia and Fastcase, that are in the legal services business, and the Internet Archive. And what we have done is we have posted the regulations for all 50 states in XML. 
Um, and that information is available on the Internet Archive. It's available at Cornell and it's available at Justia. Um, and I posted some links into the chat for, for some of those things. What we are doing now is we're bringing those state regulations into an open source content management system um, known as Indigo, which is used for state legislation. Uh, Indigo is uh, brought uh, to you by the folks that, that came up with uh, a common toso, the, the XML format that is, is then used by um, derivative formats such as the U U US legislative markup. And we have, uh, we're in the process of bringing not, not only in all 50 state regulations, but multiple code points. So what we have online right now at the Internet Archive is eight quarterly snapshots. And we have funding to continue this for another three years. So there, there's going to be an, a, another 12 snapshots. And in Indigo, when you ingest this information, you, you get some features. Um, you can see red lines. You can see how the codes changed. Um, you can modify the codes, right? So it's a content management system, and it's used by a number of governments in Africa. It's being used in India and other places. Um, and there's an API. And so you can navigate all these state codes and you can bring in um, the the uh, common TOSO version, the PDF, uh, you can uh, download HTML. And so, so far we've got um, six states loaded up in Indigo. We've got another states, eight states about to go. And our goal is by the end of the year to have all 50 state regulations in this platform, as well as 13 states for which we have their legislative codes. Um, now, as you may know, that legislative codes is a, is a somewhat controversial um, area. And in order for us to post the Georgia code, we had to get a license from the United States Supreme Court. Um, and we're still encountering resistance from some of the states um, on whether or not we can, you know, put these things online. Believe it or not, these uh, state codes often have copyright assertions. Um, so we've taken a lot of our guidance from the work that you folks have been doing at the federal level, because I, I think GovInfo and before that FDCIS, I think the work that the, the clerk office has been doing at the sector is is really standard for, for how you and how you do it properly. And our proposition to you is that we could do this not only at the federal level, but we could do it at the state and local level, that, that all edicts of government could be made more broadly available. They, they could be marked up in XML, there could be JSON metadata. Um, and I, I'm glad we're doing this and we're going to continue this effort for the next few years, but, but I got to be frank, I think it's your job, um, not, not your job specifically, but, but I think it's the government's job to make this information available. And I think in the United States, the only way this is going to ever happen is if the federal government um, extends something like GovInfo to include state legislative codes and regulatory codes and uh, um, and, and court opinions that, that are dispositive among the states. And all these resources today are very hard to get. Um, you can be spending $10 a page to get a state court opinion. And you may ask why the federal government should do this. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is, is you have the expertise and you know how to do it. And with this Indigo platform, we're trying to prove to you that it's not that hard to do, right? It, it looks daunting at first, but it's doable. But I think that if you look at the United States Constitution, if you look at the full faith and credit clause, you will see explicit authorization from our founders that, that say that this is something that you should be doing. And, and if you haven't looked at the second sentence of the full faith and credit clause, I, I would recommend you look at it because it says that the Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. And I think if you had uh, Mr. Madison in the room, I think if you had the Federalist Society there, and if you were looking at, you know, Justice Gorsuch and, and Justice Thomas, I, I think a literal reading of that clause is that Congress could mandate 
that all edicts of government in the United States are available in a clueful XML format with JSON metadata and available for bulk download. And I think if we did that, it would be transformational to the way our legal system works in the United States. So thank you very much, Kirsten. I really appreciate the invite. You're absolutely welcome, Carl, and thank you for spending the time with us and sharing your ideas and the work that you're doing. And I think um, you you wouldn't um, you're not going to get too many disagreements with us that um, all all of our law, whether it's a local level or at the federal level or any way any way in between, needs to be at a .gov website, um, regardless of which government um, agency is hosting that. Um, and we certainly know that we have some work. We, the bigger we have some work to, to ensure that at all of those um, documents you talked about are um, um, there. And Carl, I was thinking maybe for the, the next meeting, if we, um, the next public meeting, we couldn't have a, a demo of Indigo. Do you think you'll have an, enough um, states uploaded and enough of a case study ready to do a demo? Oh, we have six states in there now, and I believe by the end of uh, next week, we're going to have another eight. And yes, yes, we, we'd be more than happy to do a demo. Great, that would be great because one of the one of the things that um, is always interesting to a number of us who work on the federal level um, is that the the states draft their legislation and um, publish their law differently than we you know we have no unified code up here so it might be good to see how it presents some of that um, in India so um, it has been something to ingest all this stuff. So we get it in a, in a, a format from fast case um, known as the case maker yep. format, which is a, a, an XML. And as we ingest it, we, we look for things like unresolved links and, and things of that sort. And I can tell you, like, you know, the 1st, 6 states were really hard because they were all different. Um, and we were hoping that some of the states will be like the other states that we've done and that, and that eventually we'll be able to get all 50 states in. But, you know, we've got 6 code points for some of these states already in which, you know, quarterly releases um, over time. We're not doing this real time and that would be even harder if, if you were like bringing it in at the same time. But um, I, we, again, we're, we're trying to show that, that this is a doable thing. So if somebody looks at it and says, oh my God, I'd have to hire a thousand XML coders. Uh, we'd like to be able to say that this relatively small nonprofit operation was able to get it done. And not only that, we're more than happy to donate what we've done to the government. If, if someone wants to do an informal, non-binding version of state regulations, and that's how the federal register revamp started, is it was totally unofficial, but that was a, a um, Obama-Biden transition project. Yeah, yeah. And you also mentioned the magic words, um, a Kona Choso in your remarks. So can you elaborate a little bit more about what you're doing with the Kona Choso? So a common Notoso is a standard XML format that's very re rich and is being used for legislative markup in a number of African countries and others. Uh, USLM is derived from a common Notoso. And one of the things we're trying to do with Indigo is modify it so that there is a, a native USLM format, which is much better suited for regulatory codes and, and legislative codes. Um, and so one of our hopes, uh, we started with the Ocoman Toso because that, that is what it supports. Um, and that's working, uh, but we would like to modify it in a way that, that meets some of the work that GPO and others have been doing to, to come up with a system that works better for United States um, uh, regulatory and legislative codes. Great, great. We, I love that. And I know there's a number of us on the call who are more interested in that work that you're doing. So thank you so much for spending time with us. And um, we'll make sure that um, we keep this discussion open and that um, we we will make some space for, to see a, a demo. So thank you so much, Carl. That, thank you. And, so. um, great. And we have a we're ahead of schedule. Venice tells us Venice is helping me time keep today so it, we can stop. And if anyone has questions for Lars or Daniel or Carl or even Yuri, we can stop and, and have some time for Q&A right now. So that that is one of our purposes of these meetings is for us to try to have more discussion and not so much presentations. So we do have the Q&A and then if anyone wants to raise their hand, um, uh, Damien can unmute you and you can ask your question, um, your question. 
So I do know I have I saw one question um, sent to the panelists, and it is Carl about Indigo. It's one. Um, someone in my office is wondering if the website library dot municode m u n i c o d e dot com is using Indigo. Do you know if that answer, Carl? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so Municode and Am Legal, American Legal, and the ICC are the three education companies. There, there's a couple others. Uh, they have their own formats. Uh, Am Legal is actually very generous in allowing FTP download of their stuff. Um, it would not be hard to turn municipal codes into USLM. Um, it's it's not trivial, but it's something that we could presumably do, and if a company like Municode, which has, I think, over 6,000 municipalities that they serve, um, were cooperative, it would not be hard to, to ingest that material. Okay, great, great. Any other questions? I don't, I'll give everyone a few seconds. I know we're all in WebEx, and we all move between WebEx and Teams and um, Zoom, and so the screens are always a little different. Daniel, do you have any questions for anyone so far? I do. Um, so I, I don't know if it's fair of me to do so, but I will do so nonetheless. Yeah. Um, I just thought that it is is um, Aaron Shapiro also on this? I, I just thought it might be interesting. Um, oh, excellent. Hey, good to see you. Um, both for the House and for the Senate, like one of the, the issues that Lars was running into and maybe this is a good question for Lisa as well. Like, what was just simply getting a canonical list of all the hearings and markups that exist for a period of time for uh, either Senate committees or House committees or both? Um, and I'm just wondering, is there a, a data friendly version of it that exists that that uh, either is or could be public facing uh, that would make uh, Lars's life easier in trying to make sure that he's actually found all the proceedings? Because uh, I know that going through the committee websites is uh, um, uh, not, you know, you, you don't always know if you've gotten everything. So, like, if, if anyone has insight into that, that would be a, a great thing to learn more about. Denise, from uh, your, oh, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, happy to take a shot at this first. Thank you for the question, Daniel and Lars. Thank you very much for demoing your great work. Um, certainly uh, providing a valuable service and definitely understand the need for that. Um, before I answer your question, Daniel, the one thing I did want to point out to you, Lars, and I imagine you probably already know this, like I understand the URLs for each committee video is unique, but there's also a very predictable pattern to those, um, as I'm sure you've discovered through your, you know, work, extensive work, you know, with these and uploading those videos, like, in, especially for any committee that's likely to have more than one hearing on a calendar day. Um, you know, you can pretty much about 99% be assured of, of what that URL is going to be once that date actually happens. So, you know, hopefully that helps and, you know, having this yeah, conversation. I figured that out after discovering it because the issue with the videos, as there's no way to directly download them, I discovered through the network requests, the specific file that has the, the original timestamps. So. For those who want to actually know, the way to download the video is to get the link to the file with all the timestamps and run a video Kodak software to reconstruct the entire video from that little time that timestamp file, and then that gets uploaded to the Internet Archive. Yes, very very slick approach. Uh, so, and Daniel, onto your question. Um, you know, certainly the combined uh, congressional calendar on congress.gov now has a wealth of information on committee meetings that has occurred. You know, one thing to understand about that is that information comes from the Daily Digest, so which is an independent group within the Secretary of the Senate, one of our clerk offices. As long as the committees report the meeting to the Daily Digest, it'll show up there, which is also the same source that's used for their portion of the congressional record. What does happen on occasion is that committees will hold hearings or post things on their individual websites, which then Lars, I'm assuming you're scraping, and they may, for whatever reason, not actually uh, inform 
the daily digest of the hearing or you know should things change in terms of the date you know things that just happened maybe they updated on their website but there are procedures that have been in place for you know well over a century and legislation that dictates their reporting to the daily digest so that's the official source of information that we use for things like senate.gov and we also supply for congress.gov for consumption and display in combination with the house committee hearings so we're hoping to further expand some of these offerings, not only in the structured data that we're providing from the daily digest, but also uh, to have you know, other ways to um, access the videos, which is I, I'll get to you in uh, my prepared remarks a little later in this meeting. So, um, you know, in terms of, you know, resources that exist on public websites, um, I definitely recommend either using congress.gov, the combined committee calendar, or you can use senate.gov. Uh, we have an XML file up there that lists all the hearings that are forward looking to present and forward. So that's updates approximately every two hours um, throughout the day based on changes that are made by our office of the daily digest. I'll put that I'll put that XML file in the chat here in case anyone hasn't seen it before. And thank you. I, I'm, I appreciate it. Right, I'm familiar with the combined, uh, the, the Senate uh, XML uh, website, which is, as you mentioned, forward facing. Um, I'm trying to think whether there is a structured data version of the committee calendar that is published on, uh, on Congress. The committee, schedule? The committee yeah, schedule. schedule. Yeah, the schedule. Thank you. I'm not aware that there is, but, but I could be in error. Yeah, I think one of the, yeah, I think Daniel, I think we have a, a new, uh, what I'm hearing in your request is, do we have a machine readable list of just all of the committee meetings that have happened in the House and Senate that just verifies that these are actual meetings without having to scrape individual things across House and Senate in Congress, in Congress.gov or in GovInfo. So I think. We'll yeah, I think that's what I'm hearing. So we can take that back and and, and explore that um, between the four organizations on how we might be able to do something about that. Because as Aaron says, it is listed in the congressional record um, in the committee digest, which is the authoritative source of those meetings. Um, and so we'll need to we'll need to take that back because there is a, on the House side. I don't know Aaron, but on the House side. We do not all the information that would necessarily be on docs.house.gov is necessarily required to be in the congressional record. So there is some some gaps there. So we'll have to take that. Um, Venice, I wanted to open up this question about authoritative list of committee meetings or anything to you. Do you have anything to add to the discussion? Um, no, not at this time. Okay. Take note. <laughs> I just want to make sure I wasn't forgetting anything. Um, and actually, one of the things that the, the GPO finds really useful, on, especially on the, the House side, public facing, is the RSS feed. So if folks don't know, uh, Kirsten, about your RSS feeds that are available on the committee re repository on docs.house.gov, uh, that's another really great uh, source of information in a machine-readable format for committee meetings, including all the event IDs. Sometimes I forget about the RSS feed. It's there. It's not doesn't go back in time. So um, it just is uh, the last few. I forget how how many we publish, but I'll make sure some of us answer that question in the chat. But thank you, Lisa, for that. We um, we have a couple more minutes before um, we need to move into the next section of the meeting. I know that um, Damien, can you um, unmute Laura Lai Kelly? I, she has a question. Lorelai, were you unmuted? Sorry, Kirsten. Uh, just give me a little moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then I know that um, uh, Carl answered a question in the chat and um, that he received. So thank you, Carl. Can you hear me now? You're now unmuted. Yes. Oh, okay. Hey, hi. Hi. Wow, everybody. Wow. I'm just so impressed by all this amazing stuff people are doing. Um, my question, I might need to take off offline if it's too long of an answer, but I'm really interested in um, Lars and Carl, especially the projects that you've done with Internet Archive and how you actually set that up. I'm 
um, I've been exploring how we would maybe create as part of this digital layer or the digital ecosystem of a future con Congress, how to um, reimagine the right to petition, First Amendment responsibilities of Congress. That would uh, be a way to include and archive um, civic voice. So maybe the civic engagement activities of members where it's member curated on substance. Whereas, uh, you know, with community members, so much more Congress adjacent, not in the institution itself. Um, and I'd love to to know how you how did you get that Internet Archive to to do this? Because it seems to me that sort of a trusted public interest organization could prototype like a new right to petition mechanism um, that would include just a much more broad discourse about what's happening uh, in member communities. Um, around the country and and hopefully uh, help us process our grievances as a culture uh, more productively. <laughs> so the Internet Archive is really easy to work with. Uh, anybody can establish an account. Anybody. Um, if you end up having a collection of materials um, and you want administrator privileges so you can change the metadata and you can uh, work with the command line interface it's not it's it's pretty easy so Lars for example uh, began uploading a couple US Senate videos to the Internet Archive and it, it was a trivial thing for me to send email to Brewster Kale and a couple others and say give this guy a collection and, and make him an admin um, at which point he can manage his collection uh, there's very sophisticated command line tools so if you need to we, we have a public resource probably two and a half million objects on the Internet Archive um, you might want to build your own website that, that uses the Internet Archive as a repository, just like you might embed a YouTube video into your own website. Uh, but as a place to put your images and your video and your, your PDF files and your structured XML, it's, it's an easy first step. Um, you, you might, again, then want to like do it yourself. Uh, but if you want to experiment, if you want to prototype that that's the place you ought to be because it, it there's like zero entry cost doesn't cost money um get an account start uploading amazing thank you so much awesome and that was lorelei kelly i don't know if um one of the one of the downsides of us being in a virtual space is it's not always easy easy to swap information so that was laura laura kelly if you guys want to use the chat or the um, to swap information to get more information, that would be great. Um, of course, one of the benefits of being virtual is we definitely have folks across the country who are more able to participate um, because we are um, distributed across the country. So thank you for those of you who are on the East Coast and, and not here, uh, I'm sorry, on the West Coast and not here to um, on, on our side. So, thank you. We will move now. Um, thank you, Carl and Daniel. We'll move into our next session of um, section of presentations, and this is from our ledge branch organizations. And we're just going to go with the library, government publishing office, the Senate secretary and the house clerk's office. We're going to go in that order. And so I'd love to call in Abby Weiss and Robert Brommer from the library of Congress. Abby. Hello, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, my name, as uh, Kirsten noted, is Abby Weiss. Uh, I work for the Congress.gov team at the Library of Congress, and I will uh, go over some recent enhancements to Congress.gov. I'm going to stop my video and share my screen. All right. So hopefully we're all looking at Congress.gov. So I'm going to start with one of our bigger enhancements to Congress.gov, which was added in response to a lot of feedback we've received, which is an expanded download functionality. Prior to this enhancement, which I'll show you, uh, you could only download up to 1,000 results in a collection at a time. And if you had search results greater than 1,000, you had to filter them down into more manageable chunks in order to download all of those spreadsheets and uh, compile them into one, if that's what you wanted to do. But now we have expanded that limit to 5,000. And more than that, we've actually added the ability to select the exact fields you'd like available in your legislation download. And even more, we've actually added four new fields to the legislation download, and I'll demo those for you now. So we are looking at the home page, and I am going to expand my search form. And in the legislation collection, I am going to search for the word energy in the current Congress. 
and I am executing my search. So as you can see, I have retrieved over 3,000 results, which I can now download all at once. And before I do download those results, I am going to switch my sort from the default to co-sponsor count most to least. And I'm doing this because I want to show you how the download is able to accommodate the maximum number of results in these fields uh, that are in your results list. So I'm going to click download results. And now I'm prompted with this window that gives me the ability to select those exact fields I'd like. Uh, the checked fields are those that were already available in the download, and these four unchecked fields are the new ones. So we've got co-sponsor names, we've got legislative subjects, which are added by CRS, we have related bills that are added by CRS, the House, and the Senate, and we've got the latest summary as written by CRS. So I'm going to click Check All to see all of these new fields, and I'm going to click Download My Results. And this downloads as a CSV file and opens up in my spreadsheet application which for me is Microsoft Excel. So I'm opening that file, which will hopefully open Excel and here it goes. I'll be able to show you what this download looks like. So up until about this point, those of you who have downloaded legislation results before, it'll look familiar, but now we've gotten to these new fields that we've added. So the download, as I mentioned, is able to accommodate the maximum number of results uh, in these new fields. And obviously, as many of us know, some legislation can have many, many co-sponsors up to hundreds and I believe we had one that had 353 co-sponsors and the download has accounted for that. Same thing goes for these legislative subjects as added by CRS. And it looks like we have at least one uh, piece of legislation in our search result list that has this many legislative subjects. I'm sorry for all the scrolling. It's probably not that much fun to look at. <laughs> uh, here we are at related bills, same thing goes. These are added, as I said, by CRS, the House and the Senate and the download is able to accommodate the maximum number in your results list. The last thing that I want to show you is this latest summary. That's the last of the new fields. And here you can see some of these uh, in this box, this little preview box up here. You will notice that there are HTML codes in this latest summary. And you can use these HTML codes to format the text as we do on Congress.gov. But we also recognize that not everyone wants these HTML codes in their summary. So we wanted to provide uh, a resource to strip them out. So I'm going to close out of this and show you that resource. So back on congress.gov, in the top right-hand corner, I wanna point your attention here to the support link, and I'm going to search the congress.gov help center for HTML, Oops, excuse me, HTML. So in the congress.gov help center, I find that download search results is the page I'm interested in, and if you were to browse the Help Center, by the way, it is under searching and using Congress.gov data offsite. So on this page, scrolling to the bottom, I wanna point your attention here to how to remove special characters and HTML codes from your spreadsheet. Uh, we provide those HTML code stripping instructions, and we also found that special characters- And I have to say, like as cool. much as I'm a cheerleader Sorry. for- Looks like we have a, thank you so much. Um, the special characters do not convert properly in the CSV file. So we also included instructions on dealing with that. All right, so that's it for the download. The next thing that I wanna show you is in the members collection. So over here in the top right-hand corner, I'm going to members and scrolling down, I wanna open a currently serving member of Congress's page on congress.gov. So here we're looking at representative Adams page and in the overview, I wanna point your attention here to this contact link. This is a new feature. The clicking this link will bring you to the member's website to their contact form. And we've added this in response to feedback that we receive regularly where folks wanna be able to more easily contact their members from congress.gov. So we haven't just added this link here, we also added it to the find your members by address search. So I will show that to you as well. Back in the top right hand corner, clicking members, and here I am at find your member by address, which by the way, is also located on the homepage and in the help center. So I'm going to type in an address and I'll just do one main street and click the first option. And in this results list that also includes the map, I can see my members of Congress and there's that contact link, which again, brings you to their website where their contact forms are located. The next enhancement I wanna show you is on this page under alerts for these members, under the Your Members header. 
clicking on this link, I am prompted with this window that allows me to select the members, uh, my members of Congress, to be alerted whenever they sponsor or co-sponsor legislation. So I can click all of those and click confirm and receive that email alert. You do need, of course, a congress.gov account in order to sign up for alerts on congress.gov, and you can do that in the Help Center. And if I were not already logged in, you would have a prompt to create an account or sign in over here at the top right hand corner. Okay, the next enhancement I want to show you is in the legislation text search form. So if I'm working from the minimize view, I expand it out and I click on the legislation text search form. On this search form, we've implemented some special operators as the default for searching. And these operators, which include proximity and ordered proximity operators, allow for that exact and precise searching that a lot of our users want, especially our power searchers. Uh, and I will demo those for you. So in the words and phrases box, I'm going to type in within 10 words, I'd like to find a probe with the wild cards, so that's an asterisk, any ending to appropriate, a probe, it could be appropriation, appropriations, and then authorization. And this is also going to search for those two words in uh, that order. So I'm searching current Congress and I'm executing my search. As you can see, I pulled over 400 results and with show keyword and context checked, I can see at least some of the locations in these bill texts where my parser found some answers. If you wanna find a list of all of these operators, you can find them over here in search tools under search operators for legislation text, you can expand out that accordion. And here you can see all the operators, their use, and some examples. Going even further down, we have some combinations of those operators and some examples for you. The next thing that I wanna show you is back on the homepage, below my search forms, over here in current legislative activities, underneath recent. Right over here, we have this presented to president link, which already did exist prior to this enhancement, but we've improved it. So previously you could click on this link and it would bring you to a search results page that looked for the latest action in measures being presented to president. And oftentimes there would be no items that were presented to president and you get a no results page. So we wanted to improve that user experience and make it clear what you were clicking on and what it meant. So we'll open that page up. So here on this page, it is a list of all the measures that have passed the House and the Senate. They've been enrolled, they've been presented to the president, but they have not yet been signed or vetoed. So it's a point in time report. Uh, and as soon as these measures are signed or vetoed, they will be removed from this report. So here we have a count of the items. We're also able to sort by date. Of course, these are all the same date, so not great for a demo, but uh, as you can see, the option is there for you. And then you can also search by legislation numbers. We also provide links to those bill pages in congress.gov where you can find more information about the measures. Okay. The last enhancement that I want to show you on congress.gov is a committee alert email that we have improved upon. And just before I show that email, I do want to show how you get committee alerts just very briefly. In the top right hand corner, for those of you who don't know, you can click on committees, go to any committee profile page on congress.gov. So I've clicked on the House Agriculture Committees page and I click get alerts and I will sign up for alerts uh, for all the items that we have on congress.gov related to that committee. So the email that we've approved upon and hopefully you can all see that on my screen is we have uh, split apart committee hearing transcripts from committee meeting announcements. Previously, these were connected together, but we wanted to separate them out because we realized that these upcoming committee meetings are time pressing, you wanna know the date, the time, the location, and then these committee hearing transcripts can be published weeks, months, or even years after the fact. So we wanted to make that distinction obvious for our users. So that actually covers it for, for me, uh, for the enhancements on congress.gov. Thanks so much for everyone's time and attention. And uh, back to you, Kirsten. Great, thanks, Abby. I always love hearing the improvements that you make. Now I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Robert and he has some exciting news about the Library of Congress and Congress.gov. Thank you. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Robert, I'm a subject matter expert on the Congress.gov team, and I'm here to talk briefly about our plans to release the public beta Congress.gov API in September of this year. 
The beta API, which stands for application programming interface, will contain the data available on congress.gov in machine readable format for the public and congressional user. Um, releasing the API in beta with the plan to gather feedback, both with congress.gov and with the congress.gov beta API, our team has a good process for incorporating feedback into our development lifecycle. We assess feedback in conjunction with our available resources and data partner priorities. So the congress.gov beta API is a REST API presented in hierarchical browse format. So it's not a search API. In releasing the beta API, we hope to fulfill a number of goals. Specifically, we want to support congress.gov users to protect them from scrapers that degrade congress.gov access by providing another method to consume congress.gov data. We want to facilitate access to more complete and accurate congressional data that is available on congress.gov, including even more built data that is available through GPO's bulk data. We want to provide a useful and extensible resource to congressional users and the uh, public. Also, we have a GitHub repository where we're going to provide uh, Python and Java sample client code for users to copy and update according to their needs. We're going to provide two way communication for users to report issues or feedback and receive a response from the congress.gov team. Uh, change management communication for updates congress.gov will make to the beta API that may impact downstream users, as well as documentation on available endpoints. Uh, so, to participate uh, in testing it, we ask that you send us an email to lawoutreach at loc.gov, and we'll provide the email in the, in the uh, meeting notes, and we'll add you to the GitHub repository. We also ask that you please sign up for a beta API key at uh, api.data.gov using the same email address that you use to uh, email our law outreach account. Um, we appreciate any feedback you provide on the beta API. Uh, feedback can be shared in the GitHub repository by creating an issue. We just ask that you review existing issues before creating a new one. Um, also, please note that the GitHub space will be open to the public in the fall when the beta API is released to the public. Another thing I want to mention is that we're going to be holding another Congress.gov public forum on September 21st at 1.30 uh, via webinar. Like the previous public forums, we'll cover the latest congress.gov enhancements and updates, and we'll hold a listening session along with our congress.gov data partners to hear about how we can better serve your legislative information needs. And so for the public forum, please watch the Law Library's blog and Custodia Legis for more news. We'll post it there uh, when you can register for the uh, forum. And that is my quick update. Thank you. Awesome, Robert. That is exciting news. And um, does anyone have any questions for Robert while we're here on that API? And if you do, um, please let just either in the chat, let us know that you have a question or um, in the Q and A section. And I do understand from a um, converse or an email trail that you will be able to request the result or the APL results back in either JSON or XML. So that's exciting news. And we also will have time for questions and answers. So again, you can put that in the Q and A. Um, and Robert, thank you for announcing the public forum. If um, if I heard you right, that date is September 21st. Yes, September 21st at uh, 1.30. And great, be great. Webinar. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That'll be exciting. We'll make sure that we also post that on the events page on the innovation hub and the information on how to register for the public forum. So, if you want to um, test out the API, um, Robert gave us the information to do that and then participate in the public forum. Thank you. Library of Congress again, we'll have um, time for discussion after all our presentations. Next up, I'd love to call on the government publishing office. Um, Lisa LaPlante and Matt Landgraf. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa LaPlante, and I'm from the Government Publishing Office, and I am the Program Manager for GPO's GovInfo system. So I'll share a brief update on GovInfo uh, recent release and upcoming release, and then I'll turn the presentation over to Matt Landgraf for an update on USLM and Expo. Uh, 
All right, great. So I'll briefly talk about our June 2022 release, which will actually be deployed, deployed to our production environments this week. There are four primary highlights that I want to discuss. First is a link service for individual Senate amendments. Second is improved access to hearing addenda. Third is support for digitized committee prints and fourth API enhancements. So at our last public bulk data task force meeting, or now congressional data task force, uh, we talked about the uh, new functionality that we put in place to make individual Senate amendments their own documents that are available in the congressional record. So what that means is instead of seeing the amendment text as one big giant uh, document from a first amendment to the second amendment to the third amendment in the congressional record, we now have broken those out into individual documents. Now, in this release, we took that a step further and created a link service for all of those individual amendments. So what you'll see is a pattern using link, CREC for congressional record, S amendment for Senate amendment 117, which is the Congress, and then the amendment number. So if I click on this, it'll take you to the individual Senate amendment in the congressional record. Now, we know that folks want to see this in multiple formats, so I would encourage you to go to our link service at our link docs. And from here, you'll be able to see all of our different link services. Now, the purpose of our link service is to provide a predictable way to link to different types of documents or publications or legislation without having to know um, a lot about where what you're looking for is actually nested within that publication. So for example, if we go down to congressional record and we look at uh, Senate amendments, this will give you a place to try it out to put in your Congress number, your amendment number, and also to put in the format that you want. So if you want HTML, PDF, the details page on GovInfo, the context or related. So I would encourage you to take a look at this and let us know uh, as you use it if you have additional feedback. So here's an example. If we put in a Senate Amendment 4169 from the 117th Congress and say we want a PDF. So this is what it would look like. Senate Amendment 4169, which is related to the Colorado Outdoor Recreation uh, amendment, which was part of the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act. So a really great way to get to individual uh, Senate amendments. Next is improved access to hearing addenda. Um, you may have noticed that there, uh, and especially with recent hearings, we've seen a lot of, uh, of addendum be uh, added into GovInfo as a, say, a committee current print. Sometimes they're added in as a, uh, in our congressional hearings collection. We've standardized that process so that going forward, all addenda will be available, better uh, available ahead of the hearing will be packaged with that individual hearing. So this is what it'll look like. So here's a, a set of hearing addenda for a hearing from the House and it is from the uh, Committee on Education and Labor, and this is what the addenda will look like. So you'll be able to find them under context ahead of the individual hearing packaged with the hearing. Next is new support for digitized congressional committee prints. I'm happy to announce that we're at, we'll be adding over 6,500 prints from the House and Senate committees from multiple Congresses. So when you go to congressional committee prints, you'll see committee prints. Uh, in our test system, we have them back to 1955, but you'll be able to drill down by Congress, see different committee prints, see the individual committees, and be able to see uh, a number of, of pieces of information about those committees. So, for example, the review of Amtrak operations for the Blue Ridge from 1974. Uh, you'll have the individual hearings plus standard metadata about each of the hearings.
And finally, I'm happy to announce a number of API enhancements. So under uh, GPO's GitHub, API GitHub repository, this is specifically related to issue number 101. So let me open this up and we'll kind of review what the request was. So up until now, there we have had a limit of 10,000 items from our collections, published, and granules endpoints. And we know that there are there is a need to get more than 10,000 items from those endpoints. So uh, we put together some background, had a proposed solution, got feedback from our user community. So thank you all so much for the folks that uh, provided feedback on our approach. This is exactly what we love to do and see uh, in terms of interactions on, on GitHub. So thank you so much for that and happy to announce that this will actually be deployed uh, this week. So what we're, we're planning to do is add what's called a new offset mark. So let me click on this. Now adding this offset mark equals, and then the asterisk, will put an offset mark into the API request that will allow you to get more than 10,000 results. So when we deploy this out, we're also going to add additional information onto our GitHub API um, repository. So you'll have additional instructions on how to use this and how to get those additional 10,000 results. So we'll make that available both on the main page and also as an answer or an update onto that issue number 101 for the GitHub repository. The last item we wanna mention is the addition of some new fields that are available both in the package and granule summary. So that includes jacket ID, document class for granules, and also numbers such as hearing number for granules. So this came from feedback both outside, uh, of, um, outside of government and also inside of government. So we're collecting all of that type of feedback on our Get, GitHub repositories and putting those into our product roadmaps. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Matt Landgraf to provide an update on USLM and also to provide an update on XPUB. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, an, it's, uh, it's really nice to be here and giving updates on the USLM projects and XPUB. Give me just one moment. Okay, so um, starting with the remaining versions in USLM. Um, so the goal of this project is to ensure that the model of USLM is interoperable with the legislative ecosystem and the legislative editing and publishing needs have been addressed. Um, as you know, we started our quest to get all legislative documents in USLM several years ago with the Law Revision Council and the US Code. We then moved on to a project that um, that brought enrolled bills, public laws, and statutes at large into USLM a few years ago. And then last year, we were able to roll out statute compilations. So the next item in the, in the roadmap for USLM was to bring those remaining, the remaining bill versions, all of those except the enroll, which were already modeled, into USLM. So we've been working on this project with the House and the Senate and our, uh, and our partner, Accenture, along with the Library of Congress, to model these additional bill versions. And I'm happy to say we're making significant progress. They are, we've completed the initial modeling for most major bill versions at this point. And really what we're doing now is, is doing updates to some of our transforms to see if we can get some sample data for those major bill versions in front of our partners the House and the Senate um, in our in, in internal group for now um, and see if we've, you know, see, see how we're doing. We also, the next step will be for us to model the amendments and pre-introduced bills um, as we move forward. So look forward to more updates on those in the next meeting. I'm going to turn my attention now to XPUB and um, uh, uh, apologies ahead of time. This is uh, going to be a little bit of a repeat of the last update that we gave at the last public forum, but uh, wanted to just give a little bit of background on XPUB. So XPUB was formerly known as GPO's Composition System Replacement. 
And it's an XML based composition to replace the legacy microcomp system and the locator text format. It's a modular digital first suite of applications for XML, content creation, markup, correction, approval, and multi channel pub publishing. And it integrates with commercially available XML editors, office applications, and web based systems. So, really, the goal of XPub is to move GPO into a fully digital workflow and to be able to continue to accept content in any form. We want to be able to simultaneously generate content in a variety of print and digital formats, including USLM. We also need the ability to integrate with authoring and editing tools that are intuitive and easy to use and improve efficiency through automation. So this really represents a large shift in the way that GPO does business, specific, specifically in the pre-press organization. This is more of the comprehensive environment for managing publishing operations. So things that traditionally have been done on paper at GPO will now be done on screen and in a digital format. Things like content intake, data conversion, enterprise OCR scanning, on-screen proofreading, all those sorts of things. So that's really the background of what XPUB is going to do. And what I'll do now is shift the focus to the new HTML format that is upcoming for bills and public laws. Um, as I said, I demoed this in the last meeting, but this is a very exciting development for GPO and, and re represents a large enhancement on how we disseminate the uh, textual information for bills and public laws. So I wanted to go ahead and show it again. So what this does is it replaces that plain text file that's created as a byte that, that's currently created as a byproduct of the microcomp process and posted on GovInfo. The new responsive HTML format is optimized for any device, including mobile devices, tablets, and traditional desktops or, or laptops. It uses modern, easy to use fonts that are optimized for screen usage and search engines. And it also includes metadata and HTML tags for easy reuse by data providers. So what I'd like to do now is show you again the, the a demonstration of this new format. So let me just show you, I'll start with the first example here, and I'll show you an example of what the current text file looks like on GovInfo. If I click on text, you can see it's a plain ASCII text file. It has no formatting whatsoever and uses hard returns between lines that can make the format very hard to deal with, both programmatically and visually, really. Okay, so if we go back and click on this text here, let's look at the new HTML format. So as you can see, the display has been optimized so that it can be more easily read on the screen. We've attempted to keep the original look and feel of the bill, but have adjusted the font spacing, et cetera, to make the information more accessible and easily readable. We've also included links in the tables of contents so that you can easily jump to sections in the bill. We also have included a back to top button so that you can easily return to the beginning of the bill and navigate that way. Oops. All right, sorry. Okay, um, we go back here. And of course it's responsive so that it can be viewed on any platform. Okay. Um, so let me show you another example. In this example, you will be able to see. You, I'm sorry, in, in this example, you'll be able to see how we've handled inserted and deleted text from one version of a bill to another. As you can see here, we have the text that has been stricken through. That has been deleted and moving down further. We can see that there is inserted text that has been italicized. And if you view the source, you can also see that we've added deleted and inserted text in the, into the HTML. So you can see the INS tags here, and you can see the deleted tags here as well. Also in the source of the document, scrolling up further, you will see that a great deal of metadata has been included about the document as well. This includes common fields such as title, bill number, et cetera, but also includes common Dublin core elements and several citation formats as well. Okay. Going to our next example, 
<clears throat> the next example I'll show you is a very large bill. And as you can see, the HTML file renders very quickly and does not crash your browser. And let me scroll down to show you how nicely the tables render in this format. Just bear with me for a moment as I scroll down. Okay, so there's a table. Okay, and finally, let me show you an example of a public law. Okay. So as I go into the text, you can see that it's laid out in a very similar fashion, but we that we've included the side notes at an appropriate at, at the appropriate places in the content. One more thing I wanted to show is how we've handled the side notes from a, from a responsiveness perspective. So if I take this out of here, you can see as the window gets smaller, you'll see a subtle outline of the side note so that the user can easily distinguish between the actual text of the law and the side note itself. Okay. Okay, so the timeline for our next release for bills and public laws, we're targeting to be production ready by later this year. And we're working very closely with our partners in the House and Senate to determine what the deployment strategies will be. Um, so we'll be looking for this and an update on this in the next, uh, and I see Kirsten has her camera on. <laughs> so I will just finish up here by saying that we have the XPUB GitHub uh, re repository available and samples of the responsive HTML are up there for anyone to see. So thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Take care. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. I do have a question for you, Matt. Um, on the yes. HTML, on the HTML responsiveness, do you know when that will be released? Yeah, so we are we are shooting to be production ready later this year. And what we would really like to do is be able to um, to, to be able to roll out that format sometime in the late part of this year. Uh, we need to do some a, a lot of collaboration with the Library of Congress to ensure that the Congress.gov site is ready uh, to be able to handle that format. Uh, but we're well along in that process. So um, I think we'll have a more specific time frame for that uh, when we have our next public meeting in the fall. Okay, awesome. That's great. I'm so excited about that responsive HTML because, um, you know, those of us who have been working with the text display, um, we know the, the um, weaknesses or the downsides of the text display. So I'm just really, really excited that you, you all in Congress.gov have been working on the responsive design. And, um, and I also am, um, I think it's just very wonderful that we can have the digitally signed PDF there. So we know that that's the authoritative source that matches the printed version that has been signed and in, in that the House and Senate are archiving, but then we can have um, the text in this responsive HTML so that folks can um, can use it in a, in, in a, online in a richer manner than we can if we just had the piece of paper. So thank you everyone um, who's been working on all these ways to present um, that bill in a different format than a digitally signed, you know, PDF or a scanned in PDF. Um, although, you know, as Lisa pointed out, that is our first step. If that's all we have, then let's add it. And so I'm also excited um, about all those committee prints that um, GPO that you're uploading and putting into that repository. It is rich with information in history about um, certain subject matters. And so if you if you um, want to know about something, there's a, looking at a committee report is a great way, or a committee print is a great way of learning uh, about things. And so we know that committees, both in the House and Senate, will periodically publish maybe the history of their committee or a, um, a conglomeration of material about a subject matter and, and just publish it, and it's buried in that set of material and it's such a great, wonderful resource. So thank you for all your work. Um, thank you very with, much. You're welcome, you're welcome. With that, um, I wanna hand it over to Aaron Shapiro. Aaron, you have five minutes um, to, um, to talk about the material you wanna talk about, Aaron. And Aaron, I think needs to be added back as a presenter, um, Damian. Aaron, we're, we're getting you there. There you are. I see you back. 
Hi, thanks, y'all. Sorry about that. You know, it's nothing okay. like uh, IT issues during uh, conferences. So uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, there's two things. Uh, my name is Aaron Shapiro. I'm the Senate Web Webmaster and the Director of Web Technology uh, for the Office of the Secretary of the Senate. Uh, there's two things I'd like to briefly uh, mention to you all today. Um, the first has to do with um, some major back-end advancements we've been making with the Library of Congress, which is how we transmit um, and provide them with our legislative information that is captured by the Senate clerks dutifully on a daily basis uh, with great accuracy. Uh, we're replacing the existing method that's been in place for over 20 years with a much more modern, granular uh, approach uh, that also has greater capabilities for things like timeliness and uh, giving different formats of data. Um, currently, this is to replicate existing systems we already have in place, but the hope is with this new foundation, we'll also be able to expand um, to not only send smarter data, but hopefully additional data that can also be interrelated in a multitude of ways um, on public websites and you know through these um, great advances by our partners through other methods such as APIs and the like to get to other, you know, other sites with this, you know, ex extremely important and accurate information. So that right. continues to advance, um, you know, imagining this will finish up either at the end of this year or next year. Um, and then we'll have this new process on the latest and greatest pieces of technology using, you know, the best practices to, um, you know, further grow our data and um, its dissemination. Uh, and another project that um, has just gotten way um, and that I'm excited about, but we probably won't see the fruits of for some time yet is, you know, uh, the conversation between the House, the Library of Congress, um, NARA and the Senate regarding access and preservation of floor proceeding videos. Um, and hopefully this will eventually expand into other videos too, such as committee meetings. I know there's a lot of interest in both of these areas. Um, we do have some processes in place, but they're definitely in need of updating. So we're in this partnership with these three other groups. Um, and I should also mention the Senate Archivist has been uh, instrumental in getting this all started uh, to, you know, review what's currently being done, um, define how things have changed, and then eventually implement greater access to these very important pieces of information as well. Um, and hopefully to be done so in such a way where we can integrate other pieces of information all together um, in the growing web of information regarding congressional data. So um, definitely happy to take any questions if there are any, or you know, we can address them at the end. Awesome, thank you, Aaron, for that update. I, I too am ex getting excited about what we can do with video data. Um, not only the data for the proceedings, but an, um, a number of committees are also accepting video as part of their official records. So submitted to the record. So there's kind of two different categories of video data that we need to be paying attention to. But I'm really excited about opening that up as a topic matter for this task force and how do we work um, with all those organizations you, you said, NARA, GPO library and then the house and senate committees and our recording studios and for all of that so great thank you so much and then um up next um we will have time for q a up next um we do have some updates from the clerk's office so i'm going to call on denise um to help us but i'm gonna um run the slide deck so i'm going to share my slide um, and get us um going and uh, venice Okay, Th thank you, Kirsten. Um, so you all saw this slide earlier that Kirsten showed, and we're going to recircle back to talking about moving from the um, the paper process into the digital layer. So um, as you all know, we are adding a, all a digital layer um, to the century old centuries old process paper process. Um, and so in the next slide, um, you see a picture of the hopper. So we're still using the traditional paper process. Members still can submit bill proposals or what we call bill introductions into the wooden box on the House chamber. It's still there today. Um, and in April 2020, the Speaker of the House directed our office to create an electronic submission process. 
We did this in just three days. We, cre we created a process and procedures for submissions and stood up a secured email solution so that members could email their bills to our office. So since April of 2020, the secure email solution has become an integral part of the House operations and is the primary means by which members submit bills and resolutions. Our, our initial electronic solution that we stood up in 2020 was a simple solution. And so in, um, next slide please, Kirsten. So in April of this year, we released what you're seeing now, um, the, the new second edition of the eHopper. So instead of having members and their staff submit simple emails, we created a web-based solution with a guided information tooltip, built-in logic, and minimum steps. Um, so what you see on this slide is a portion of our landing page on the eHopper with messaging that's controlled by the bill clerk. So we can let them know when the eHopper is open and then this slide you can see that. So in the next slide, um, you can see that the eHopper is closed and this messaging um, is controlled on a back-end component by our bill clerk. And so this mirrors um, when the physical hopper is open that we saw. So in our next slide, um, you can see how we've introduced some of the human-centered design that we kept in mind when we, when we designed the system. Um, our goal was to receive accurate submissions. Um, so we built the eHopper with logic that guides these submissions in simple steps. Um, and, and you can kind of see in, in like one of the little icons there, the, there's a tooltip. There, there we go. So there's a tooltip with a little eye that gives um, staff a little bit more information about what they're seeing. So to keep on with that accurate submission. Um, in the next slide, we can see what happens at the summary stage. So after they've gone through all of their steps, we can see in this slide that um, there's a summary page that the member offices has completed after they've introduced their bill um, or their co-sponsor, depending on the form that they're using. Um, in our office, we're, we're, we're practicing agile software development and continued um, enhancements along the line. So one of the enhancements that we just released was based off of member feedback. So you can see that little exactly, thank you, that attachment feature there next to the PDF. And that, that gives them the ability to see what they've submitted. So we're keeping that in mind as we're continuing to develop. Um, and since the launch of the eHopper, um, uh, in the next slide, so since the launch of the eHopper, we have a little over a third of our submissions that are coming directly from the eHopper website. Um, we also are seeing that there's more activity on legislative days. And so I guess we proposed the question, which one would you use? Hopefully, hopefully moving toward the electronic submissions. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. And I'll just give us, um, and you can all hear me. I'm unmuted. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a couple updates, um, uh, further updates from our clerk's office. We, that was one of our products we released um, this spring was the eHopper. And we are um, getting ready to release our comparative print suite um, housewide, as well as our first modules of the new LIMS uh, software. These are internal products um, to the house community that they'll be using. And as many of you know, the LIMS system, legislative information management system, is a system that we enter in the, ma the majority, if not all, of the data that goes over to Congress.gov to tell you the status of bills. So um, we're excited to um, modernize that legacy system. Other items, we did issue an RFI, um, some RFIs on the committee vote a database and the committee, um, a common committee scheduling tool. This was at a request of the select committee on the modernization of Congress. We did receive a number of, su of submissions and we were re are reviewing them and we'll um, send to our oversight committees and to the clerk our recommendations after um, our division and legislative computer system reviews that. And we also are getting ready to um, rewrite the lobby disclosure system, which will help us um, reach those unique IDs for lobbyists. And another big um, project that we're starting is the rewrite of the member information system so that we can make improvements on the data that is published um, around members on our clerk.house.gov website, particularly that XML file. 
we know that we do have some delay in um, when that XML file is updated with with the member. And one of our goals is is the the minute the clerk is certified certifying the resolution that elects a member to a committee, that XML file um, is being prepared and updated. And that as soon as she certifies that that's the resolution, then we can publish that data on um, house.gov so it will be more timely. I'm going to turn it back to Denise to talk about a little bit about our work that we're doing with congressional redistricting. Denise? Thank you. As Kirsten mentioned, one of our mission critical systems is MIS. And so with regards to the upcoming elections and change of Congress, our office continues to work with our data partners in CAO's office to share information. Um, in particular about congressional redistricting. So we're, we're, we're doing some analysis work um, as we prepare for a seamless transition from the 117th Congress to the 118th Congress on redistricting analysis and also the impact that it's gonna have on our systems, um, especially with regards to the predecessors. So um, we are gonna just continue to update you all on this important work. And that's all I have to share on that, Kirsten, thank you. Thank you. Great. We're doing great on time, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We do have time for more Q and A. And so I would invite our panelists to um, turn their cameras on and we um, do have time for more discussion and questions and answers. Um, if we'd like to do that, I do know that um, that pop Fox. Thank you. Pop Fox has um, published an informative article on the e hopper. So I will make sure that that we put that in the um, chat so people can see that. Any questions or comments from anyone? Any of the participants want to add additional information or additional comments at this time? Wow, are we really that we did that such uh, a thorough I, I, job? I think no one I saw has I think I saw Daniel's hand raise. Which, oh, there uh, is Daniel's hand. Go yeah, ahead, Daniel. Yeah. Don't you all miss me? So, first of all, the presentations have been fantastic. So much good news uh, from from the API to changes with videos um, to even improvements in in how you can uh, read the the text of legislation to links to the Senate amendments, which is like this is all great. And I know there's a lot of things that I missed, but don't worry, it'll all be in my notes. Um, which are now at five pages, sorry. Uh, there was actually a question in the chat uh, that I wanted to elevate uh, from okay. Jan Williams, and I apologize if I'm getting your if I'm getting your name wrong. The question was, what are things in place to make sure that if this information is scraped and or accessed through these APIs, that it can't be changed by bad actors and then republished on the web? Uh, this was actually a question that was put to the bulk data task force uh, when it was created, that was addressed by the working group. Uh, I'm happy to to reshare what the the, inf the answer was on that, uh, but I don't want to um, step on anyone's toes in case someone else wants to answer instead. Well, I can also I can give part of the answer on this one. So, you know, in terms of, of government publications that are available from GPO's GovInfo system, we take a, a couple of different steps. So, first of all. We digitally sign the PDF documents, so that's uh, one way that you're able to uh, verify or have uh, a validation that information has not been changed. Another thing that we do is we apply a SHA-256 hash value to all digital objects that we make available. So that's not just PDF, that's XML, that is, um, that's those text files, that's anything that you can see off of the GovInfo UI. So the way that you would check that, you would go into the premise XML file, you would see, look for the SHA-256 hash value, and you check that hash value of the digital object or whatever you've downloaded against what we publish on, on uh, GovInfo. So, and I can actually show that because I had a feeling that this was gonna, gonna come up in a question. Great, so, yeah. Lisa, yeah, yes, please show that because I was trying to take notes and, and did a terrible job adding it in the chat. So please show how we would do that. Absolutely. Let me just get this. Move everything out of the way. 
All right, so from the uh, from any details page, and I'm sorry, I, I closed out that screen, but from any details page on GovInfo, you'll find a link to a premise file. So it's P-R-E-M-I-S and you're looking for, uh, so for example, this was a premise file for that uh, committee print that I showed during my demo. So it was a committee print from the 93rd Congress. Uh, we can see that it is in PDF A format. Uh, we know that here is the, the message digest algorithm was a SHA-256, and here is the SHA-256 hash value. So that's what we recommend that you check against. And because this is a PDF document, this is also digitally signed. So if it's a PDF document, there's an additional set of information that's recorded in premise related to the uh, digital signature. Lisa, can you tell us about the ISO standards that the GPO repository has recently gotten accredited for that in, um, in, improves the, the stability or the security of, of the system? Yes, definitely. So we are ISO 16363 certified. That is, a we are a trustworthy digital repository. We were the second organization in the world to be certified and accredited with that. Um, the first organization did not maintain their certification, so now we are the only organization in the world to have and operate and maintain our certification uh, for a ISO 16363 trustworthy digital repository. So now what that means is there are a set of 109 criteria in the areas of digital object management, security and risk management, and organizational infrastructure that we have to meet and provide evidence to an external accrediting body, accredited auditing body, every year to show and demonstrate how we meet that criteria. So that's something that's that's uh, very important to GPO to be able to uh, show that our objects are uh, authentic and official. So uh, let me know if the folks have any questions about about that certification or what we're doing in terms of our ISO certification. Great, I think great. Uh, who did I see? Carl. Thank yep. Go ahead, Carl. I wanted to add one thing. To that and and uh, so the federal government is doing just a beautiful job of making bulk data available and and you know this is something I've been looking at for 20 30 years and it's been incredible the amount of progress. There's always going to be downstream users. There, there's going to be Lexus and West are going to make you know the CFR and the U.S. code available. Um, there's going to be startups and the question is how do you know that what you're looking at is real? And the answer to that is because you know you can always go to GovInfo and you can pull up the, the SHA-256 and, and you can verify the digital signatures. And that's why my proposition to you that the federal government should be putting all edicts of government in the United States available, right? The, the entire rule book. Uh, there needs to be an authoritative source for that. And I, I think that, you know, having the GPO out there to to validate and verify this information is a good model, uh, but we need to do better um, and we need to do the states and the municipalities and, and the rest of our laws. So my, my soapbox, so I just wanted to add that. Great and we Carl, I just want to thank you for for getting on the soapbox and having confidence in. In the work that GPO is doing in this area, because I think. Not only did the House and Senate really request them to look at that, but then folks like Lisa and Matt have really taken it serious to try to find the technology and and the standards to, to do it right. And um, Lisa, how many hours did you spend on your ISO certification? <laughs> it's a, it, it, it takes some time. Um, <laughs> Uh, a lot of it had, you know, we have a lot of, of our design documentation already documented, but there's there's um, a good amount that goes into collecting the evidence for each of those 109 criteria. And, you know, in addition to providing written evidence, we also um, each year have to meet with those auditors. And of course, during COVID times, it's been virtual. And not outside of COVID times, it would be in-person meetings where they looked at our data centers and, 
you know, we had uh, 16 hours worth of sit down meetings where it's going criteria by criteria and not just saying, here's the documentation, but here is a demo. Let me show you this. Let me point this out in code. Let me show you where the SHA 256 hash value is in our premise file. So it was, um, it's good. It's good. Every year it's something we look forward to. Good, good. Well, thank you so much for that work. We just have a couple more minutes that we can have discussion before I show some closing slides and close us out. Any other comments by anyone or questions? We have a lot of experts um, here in the panel in the panelist area, so and we certainly are happy to unmute anyone. And uh, let me. I haven't looked at the Q and A. Is there any questions that we're leaving off the Q and A? Don't think. No, we are not. Okay. Well, with that, let me let me have ask Damien to give me back the presenters rights and I'll I'll share my closing slides and I want to just thank all the panelists again for being here and all the attendees to being here um and thank you for the the um the 2 hours I I like that we didn't feel rushed in this meeting so we're going to stick to the 2 hours I like that we had our civic organizations and advocates first so I'm going to propose that every other meeting we switch back and forth between the ledge branch organizations and our civic um Society organizations and public interest advocates. So, thank you. And with that, I'm going to share our, my closing slides and um, get us out of here because the two hour meeting is a long meeting. So, as we all know, our resources are on the um, GPO innovation hub on GitHub, and we will be posting the meeting video um, as well as all the slides that were presented today. So, if um, you are a presenter today and have slides, please make sure that you send those to me and we'll get those posted on the Innovation Hub. The next meeting of the Congressional Data Task Force will be a date set in August and September. It will be um, this 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time zone because that gives us the greatest participation. So please um, watch for that date. We've had meetings both on Tuesday and Thursday. And we'll probably stick to Thursday and Thursday time schedule. Wednesday's a, a, a little busy, so watch for that. And thank you, Daniel, for always elevating the meeting in your weekly um, newsletter. So thank you for that. And with that, I'd like to close out our first meeting with our new name, the Congressional Data Task Force. And I want to thank everyone for being here. And um, and if you need my contact information, here's my contact information. Um, but again, thank you all for attending, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>